Welcome to part three of my female athlete series. Today I'm joined by fellow sports dietitian from all the way in New Zealand, Dane Baker, and he's going to shed some light on REDS or relative energy deficiency in sport. It's definitely something that affects females, but we also do talk about the male athlete too, because it is not purely females. He's worked for High Performance Sport New Zealand for 13 years now. He was on the New Zealand support team for the Rio Olympics back in 2016, the Gold Coast Commonwealth Games in 2018, and has had a long career in team sports. So he worked at the FIFA Sports Medicine Facility as a sports nutrition specialist in Qatar. He is currently the sports dietitian for Chiefs Super Rugby, the Blackfern Sevens team, New Zealand men's hockey, and spent seven years working with New Zealand swimming as well. He's also a lecturer at Auckland University and is involved in various research projects, particularly in the elite rugby space. I mean, talk about overachiever. I thought I was bad. This guy's busy. He also currently works in private practice in a REDS clinic at Axis Sports Medicine in Auckland. So I'll link the details for that in the show notes. Like me, Dane is definitely a practitioner and he's got some really practical tips if low energy availability or REDS is something on your radar, what the difference is between those and some signs and symptoms to look out for, plus what do we do to make sure that we don't get into this rut of low energy availability for the female athlete, but also for the male. So let's dive into part three of the female athlete series, all about REDS. Welcome to the Triathlon Nutrition Academy podcast, the show designed to serve you up evidence-based sports nutrition advice from the experts. Hi, I'm your host, Taryn, accredited practicing dietitian, advanced sports dietitian, and founder of Dietitian Approved. Listen as I break down the latest evidence to give you practical, easy to digest strategies to train hard, recover faster, and perform at your best. You have so much potential, and I want to help you unlock that with the power of nutrition. Let's get into it. Joining me all the way from across the pond in New Zealand is Dane Baker. Welcome. Hi, how's it going? Thanks for having me. (laughs) You're so welcome. Thank you for taking the time to talk to me. You're a busy man. You do so many things, and you've got your fingers in all the pies, so it's an honor to be able to pick your brain all about reds today. No worries. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Ew. All right. Well, let's get straight into it. For people listening that have no idea what REDS is, what on earth are we talking about? Yeah, it's probably a good question. I, I guess REDS is, I guess it's a, what they term it, like a syndrome that really gets underpinned by low energy availability. I guess in simple terms, it's the physiological consequences of a prolonged period of being in a state of low energy availability. And then that has flow on effects to different systems, different organs, uh, metabolic rate, all sorts of different systems in the body. And I guess REDS has expanded from the original female athlete triad, which looked at bone, menstrual cycle, to all these other systems that we know are starting to get affected. And I guess the research is just evolving over time. Yeah, the more we know, like the more we unlock around how it actually works, because it does affect so many systems in the body, doesn't it? It's not just it's not just those two things, and it also encompasses males, which I think is really important. It's not just a female syndrome. Yes, yeah, and unfortunately, it's it's hard because so much of the research is focused on females, especially early on, where a lot of that really high quality research around the female athlete triad, um, and now just trying to expand that to males. In my experience, working with specialists, it's a lot harder to diagnose in males and males are a lot more resilient to lower energy availability, but it definitely is something that can happen. Um, I just, I probably just, the level of the effect on the system may be a little bit different. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Um, uh, from what I've read, I, I guess there's the the evolutionary protection of reproduction. So that's essentially what the body's trying to protect is it's it's a stress response where this is not a good time to reproduce whether it's in times of war famine or now we have other stresses and you know low energy availability from people just not eating enough so where the 
the male athlete, yeah, there's just a, a different hormonal system and maybe there just needs to be more research, but we know probably bone density is, is protected a little bit more in males from okay. the research so far compared to females. Um, yeah, I guess that's the, that's the part of it. Yeah, hey, cool. So what is low energy availability for like you and I, we really understand that deeply, but a lot of people actually have no idea what that term means and how to identify if you are in low energy availability. Yeah. So I often talk to patients around because I use energy availability every day and it's the explanation is most of us have an understanding of energy balance, which is calories go in, calories go out. We, your body weight might go up or down. The problem there is that your body's your your metabolism is always in a state of flux. So your body can adapt to those calories, whether they're a little bit high or whether they're a little bit low. And body that's where body weight can get quite confusing. And what energy availability is, it's this core amount of energy that your body has left over that we can calculate by intake that has its error, but we we're estimating how much energy from food your body's got left over. And we use the kind of uh, equation around calories left over per kilogram of, of fat-free mass or, or lean, mouth, lean muscle. Um, and so that is a little bit more of a core, I guess, equation compared to energy balance. Um, where energy balance, it's very hard to understand your metabolic rate, your um, non-energy expenditure, thermal effective food, all those things are really, and they're, they're always changing. So um, and originally a lot of the work was done in, um, in, I think it was in birds in like successive like mating and reproduction where they would use these kind of equations to feed them and then understand reproduction. And that's when Anne Locks kind of got a little bit deeper in, in using these formulas. And it's just a way that you can give an insight into energy, I guess, in people. Yeah, it's so cool. It's really hard to calculate all those things, particularly for the listeners. They're all triathletes. So they're training for three sports in a week. And, you know, the energy availability, the energy intakes or energy expenditure should be changing on a daily basis. And I know a lot of them count calories and track calories in and out, which we know that there's limitations with both of those models. So I'm really pro just getting them to understand how to periodize their food to training without having to do that because it is gray. Like it's so hard to do this stuff, even in a lab with a research study where you've got someone in a tent and you're getting them to breathe in and breathe out and you're capturing everything that's still going to change on a daily basis and then throw three sports in the mix too. Yeah. It's never a stable measure for a triathlete. And I think that's really important because as an endurance athlete, they are one of the key risk groups for low energy availability and therefore reds. So yeah. do you have any advice for somebody that is, maybe trying to track calories or trying to understand what their overall energy in energy out looks like in a week? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I think the first place to start is if you are trying to track your energy availability, just know that there is a lot of error in that process simply by how much you eat is hard to actually, there's probably a 20 to 30% error in that. Thank you. Under, <laughs> understanding your expenditure can be, yeah. Cyclists, it might be a bit easier, but also the formulas and low energy availability around exercise energy expenditure. So we're not thinking about the metabolic expenditure that's just going on at the time. And sometimes these devices pick that up as well. So it's typically a little bit lower, but coming back to your question, I, I think the key message is we have these kind of so-called thresholds around energy availability around the, which we can go into a little bit later, like the 30, the 45. The only ways we really have those in detail are in really, about 50 or 60 participants in really high controlled lab studies. So even those thresholds in real life situations, it doesn't mean you're in high or low because your body, there's a whole lot of other factors as well that's going into that. And that's what the latest sort of reviews are looking at is that you've got the additional psychological stress. You've got, there's probably a genetic element to this. So there's going to be no cutoff to say, hey, what are you doing? You're 29 kilocal per kg per day you're on low energy. So you're looking how your body's responding. And that's, that's what you're probably doing with your coach. It's how are you responding to the training? How's your fatigue? How's, you know, overall like injury, illness, sleep, all of these things may be kind of saying, and the key one, which we can discuss obviously is tracking menstrual cycles. 
and th and that that's probably what we're doing and exactly what you talked about is having these good uh nutritional interventions around keeping it simple um, unfortunately the area when i work with patients i'm working with patients that have been in a real energy deficient state for a long period so we actually try to educate them around what they need and that's so it's a little bit different than yeah if we've got an athlete that's healthy competing well we just want them to be eating well really yeah amen i'm glad you're on the same page as me with that thank you for backing yep. up my messaging that <laughs> i've been talking about for a long time yep so well, we can dive into those cutoffs a bit later but Firstly, like if somebody is worried that they might be in low energy availability, what are some of the things that they can look out for or signs and symptoms that they may not be eating optimally to support their training? Yeah. So I guess if we start with the female, probably, obviously the key thing is irregular menstrual cycles or absent cycles or a prolonged period without a period. So in New Zealand, our first port of call is the GP. That's the first place to start. And the challenge there is if the athlete or patient's on an all contraceptive pill, then that will be masking yep. the cycle. Yep. So that's the challenge. So that probably rules out like 50 to 60% of a lot of athletes. Then the other side signs to look at is obviously like, I guess, excessive fatigue, not responding to the training. Um, there's also been evidence around sleep. So sleep can be a factor. These often tie really closely with probably overtraining. So it, there can be an element of just, you know, overreaching. And it, it doesn't mean that you're off, you've got reads. And that's probably where a lot of the information now is trying to get people to have context. It's, it's the exposure to low energy availability that can long-term cause a down regulation. Um, and then in New Zealand, we would then, if there is a concern, would be then scaled up to a experienced sports physician or a reproductive endocrinologist. And because there may be other reasons why there's a menstrual cycle that's irregular. It could be um, polycystic ovary syndrome. There could be other more nasty things at play. So you really need to exclude all of those other things. And that's what they talk about as a diagnosis of exclusion, because essentially you're excluding everything else and you need blood levels. You need an experienced you know, clinician to be able to do that. Um, but I don't think it hurts if you are concerned with that that you address in nutrition. I think that's going to go hand in hand anyway. Yeah. So, it, but I think it can help not to just think that it's reds because it's an absence cycle. I've seen that enough now that you've, you really want that sort of followed up with your medical lead. Yeah. It's a bit like gut things. It's a process of elimination. It's not this, it's not this. So it must be this in a way. <laughs> yeah. There's a good point because gut is another symptom. So I think, um, Catherine Ackerman's research, they did, I think they surveyed about 1,100 patients at their sports medicine clinic, and there was almost a double the double prevalence of gut issues in patients at risk of low energy availability. So, yeah, we get, I'd say probably half the patients I see that are diagnosed will have had quite significant GI issues. Mm. And a lot of them are unresolved, like IBS diagnosis. They've had colonoscopies, all sorts of investigations, and often it's a it's a low energy availability thing. Yeah, because it does affect all of the systems of the body. And if things aren't working properly, then your gut's not working properly yep. either. And and it's often one of the things that happens with endurance athletes or triathletes in particular, particularly running. And you sort out somebody's fueling and get that better and they kind of miraculously disappear. Yep, exactly. And that's why I guess our approach is to try to use the energy availability concept to get them to buy into that because – it's quite hard if you've got someone that's having a lot of GI issues and you just, your answer is just you need to eat more. That's often it's not going to go too well. So mm -hmm. I guess you need to kind of get them to buy into why they need to feel more. And I think having that understanding of you're in a state of low energy availability, your gut's down regulating, this is also affecting other systems. That's what we've found that actually there's almost like a bit of a light bulb moment that they're like, oh, okay, I'm willing to, to try this. And then, we often see there's a period of one to two months of, of probably more bloating as you try to get that in it. But there's a few things you can do to prevent that a little bit, but ultimately it's, you need to kind of get through that initial stage. And that's when a lot of patients start feeling a lot better. What sort of things can you do to prevent that or minimize that extra bloating that might happen in yeah, that transition so phase? I'm probably just referencing other people, but I'm a um, big fan of Dana Liz's work and I've seen her present a lot of times and 
not going i'm not a big I'm, I'm not experienced that area around the fodmap but not doing a full exclusion but maybe there's she talks about the the offenders of like fodmaps and maybe we just yep. look to reduce those so yep i find probably 95 percent of patients have already excluded gluten yeah and they're probably already <laughs> excluded dairy and so they're the probably, devil right yeah <laughs> so maybe you keep those things out but i try to educate that as you recover you your gut will be able to tolerate these things and so it could be lactose free milk it could be like sourdough bread it could be lower fiber options um the sweeteners they're often a real risk like the protein bars and protein powders they're in most cases they're the main offender i think see in a lot of cases so it's just finding better options or taking those out um spreading out the intake is obviously a key one yeah uh, yeah and i think a lot of people end up having less and less so they they don't actually feel before and we know that having something in the gut and hydrating is, is going to be beneficial yeah so, okay. but i do think it was interesting the uh female health conference they were talking about now with the younger athletes avoiding those exclusion diets because it is quite triggering mm. and i think that's yeah I, I agree with that i think yeah, it's just another thing to control when yeah. you potentially already have a restrictive diet in the first place. Yep. And I, I see, maybe it's just a New Zealand thing, but I see a lot of patients go through the uh, FODMAP experience, but they don't actually come out of it. They just keep everything excluded. They don't really challenge. Yeah, that, that happens here as well. And that's just education. They've done yeah. it by themselves or the GP said, go and do this diet, look it up online but then yep. have no idea about the impact of the long-term implications of excluding all of those foods because they're so good for our gut. Yep. I think, I can't remember the paper, but they did some research and understood that the your gut microbiota changes with two weeks of the FODMAP diet. So it's not a long-term thing. It is really just a test diet that you do for a short period of time and then you want to get off it. But yeah, very yep. common for me to see that over here as well. And globally, yep. people get thrown on it have no idea how to do it properly because they're not working with a sports dietitian and then yeah stay on it forever yeah yeah and we i think we see a disconnect too from the dietitians prescribing that uh there's a pretty clear and obvious low energy availability thing going on here when you've got yeah. a 16 year old presenting with stress fractures no period and then fodmap diet because of the gut health you're like well so i think ding, maybe ding, 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 ding. yeah alarm yeah. bells yeah. So hope yeah, we're getting I think it's we, we put a lot of work into GP education. So hopefully it's it's getting better. Yeah, awesome. And so that's the females. What about the males? What are some signs and symptoms a male athlete could look out for to make sure they're not in low energy availability? Yeah. So I guess similar probably from a fatigue perspective, I guess all the markers of your wellness type markers you're looking at with training and trying to understand if it's excessive and they're not responding to the training um, i think especially around testosterone like mood and you know enjoyment is is a big one that can be picked up uh, potentially a bit of body language with experienced coaches also a lot of work's been done in sort of hormones and around like morning erections those things so it's a little bit other things greg shaw's done a bit of work in that and it's yeah, like, it, yeah it is a hard thing i guess to have those discussions but i think it I think one of the best things I've heard those guys talk about is if you've got young guys and they're not, you know, going after life and getting out there and it's probably a bit of a warning. So if they're subdued yeah. and um, you can test testosterone and I've, I've seen many, like talked to many specialists and seen them present around the challenges of, there's a lot of reasons why the testosterone might be low and some of that supplementation, some of it can be, um, yeah uh steroids so yeah it's not a clear and sometimes it, the testosterone isn't really low so it's again it's it's a little bit more challenging to get the actual diagnosis in the males yeah uh, so just feeling tired fatigued not really absorbing in training and reduced sex drive yeah yeah if you can measure that somehow yeah um <laughs> and yeah, and I guess if you are going to measure those hormones, try to do it with a specialist so they can understand the context of the time of the day, what this actually means, what what could be affecting those numbers. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was trying to – and I guess obviously injury history, illness, um, that might play a bit of a part as well. Like maybe 
soft tissue injury, all those kind of things. And I guess just like maladaptation as well. They're just not adapting like to the training yeah. and having to look there nutritionally to see if there's anything that can be helped. Yeah. It's not like a one thing's going to fix it, is it? It's definitely multifactorial. Yeah. And like you do in clinic, like working with that person, understanding what's actually going on first and everyone can probably do with a little bit of understanding fueling better for their sport, I would say. Yep. Yep. And sometimes as well, I've seen like maybe not so much in the endurance athletes, but fighters in particular, it's like the continued weight cuts and then yeah. the body just stops responding. So they're not losing any weight. They're not, lo- they're not changing body composition yet. They're just on a minimal intake. Yep. So that, that's kind of warning signs. Yet yeah, your system starting to get affected pretty quick. Mm. So there's some good, good sort of things to look out for if you are listening and you're like, holy crap, I'm worried, but it's okay. <laughs> Just work, work with a sports dietitian to understand how to fuel yourself properly for your sport. And one other thing as well is there's been a bit of research around cholesterol levels. So that's often one we see is the, the cholesterols are normally high for an athlete. So that can be a bit of a um, sign as well. Not in everyone, but it, it does appear quite often. Is that because the body is releasing it into the bloodstream for fuel? Um, not sure. I think there's a cardiovascular response. There's there's evidence showing now that there's increased plaque in the arteries from states of low energy availability. Yeah. So yeah, so it's a it's a concern that it's yeah, again it's affecting different parts of the body. And I guess as well that you know, the the arteries, the endothelial cells, all those, you know, can be affected by low energy and you know, protein synthesis as well. There you go. Cool. I didn't know that one. Yeah, it is something that it is in the it is in the sort of I guess the position statements. But working with your sports physicians and endocrinologists, you're always looking at the blood levels, and it, it does often come up. Yeah, awesome. Well, not awesome, but good to know. <laughs> yeah. So if if somebody does suspect that they are in low energy availability and they are you know presenting to a doctor, presenting to a sports dietitian, what are the some of the things that we can use? What are the tools that we've got in our tool belt to then diagnose it, which is really difficult? Yep. So I guess the key message is you're not going to diagnose someone with reds for a dietary assessment. Um, it can be a good educational tool. I guess one of the things you often see, and I've been I've done this when I've worked in elite teams, is like this about 10 years ago you measure what they do you measure what they expend and you're like oh they're all low on energy and it's just because rugby players are terrible at doing food diary yeah <laughs> and <laughs> then miss reports yeah. and you need seven days of data and reviewers like we're seven days and you're like well i've got four days and that was enough before they all wanted to yeah. punch me because they were getting sick of it so yeah <laughs> um, it is everyone will eat differently across different days and you'll, you'll typically just see everyone's in low energy availability because they under report yeah um, so the key thing is for a diagnosis would be if there is a high level of a concern to go through the GP and then do a battery of tests, have a full clinical examination with a with someone that's experienced in redis, whether that's a sports physician or an endocrinologist. And then what we're looking at doing, if that's a diagnosis where they'll go through, exclude all the other things that it could possibly be, then we're working on the energy availability to start. Uh, returning that athlete with its female to having regular cycles. Um, in the clinic I work in, they'll use a lot of blood work where every six weeks the patient might do a repeated hormonal test and we can actually see those different, like the estrogen, the ideal world is it slowly starts to go up and then it goes up to a certain level and then that patient might have their first period and then the goal from there is trying to get that cycle within that sort of 28 to 35 days. Yep. And so they'll do tests as well if ovulation is occurring. And it can be a process. So it can be, we often say it can be 12 months. It might even be 24 months before that cycle's really regular. And, and that level will depend on the patient. If there's a strong, I guess, disordered eating element to this, then that then we need sort of specialist services around that. It can also depend on how long they've been in low energy availability. If it, they've just kind of dipped into it recently, they can typically get out a little bit quicker. Um, but there's a lot of factors at play, stress, um, how much training they're doing. I can show them what fueling looks like, but if their training is high intensity all day, every day, it's, you know, you've got a lot of other things going on there with regards to stress. Mm. So 
it is it is a challenging piece, but I definitely say uh, diagnosis needs to be yeah specialized, I guess. Yeah, and you may never get a diagnosis necessarily and have that, you know, written down on a piece of paper, but it doesn't necessarily mean that's not you or you're not affected by a low energy uh, availability. Yeah. So going through all of this stuff is still really useful. And the challenge we sure. have in New Zealand is it's private healthcare to see these people that's not covered by um, in New Zealand. We have our sort of ACC, which is our government sort of insurance. So it does often involve quite a bit of cost, and we, we know we're missing a big chunk of the population that don't have access to that um, resource, really. Mm. Yeah, I think that's really important. So what are the, some of the things that you do with somebody that you would see in clinic then to help them through low energy availability or REDS? Like, let's get let's get practical. That's my happy place. Yeah, yeah so I, I do Probably think... yours too. Uh, yeah, so probably to give context... I overnight just started working in Reds, but I'd been working with professional rugby, swimmers, hockey players. It would always been like, I was really passionate about the concept of energy availability because it's, I think it's a really nice way to educate athletes, patients around putting their different days together, their weeks together, rather than just like in nutrition, have this much about carbohydrate, this much protein. You get into those real uh, emotional debates around carbohydrates. And so it's like, okay, your body needs a certain amount of energy. It might not need all this. It might need some. What? How much do we need to get? So I work on essentially trying to optimize each patient's energy availability and talk them through different days. So I do a full hour consult, try and understand their training week, their different days of training, what they're currently eating. We don't try to analyze that from a calorie perspective. It's more like a, I guess, a um, assessment or interview. And then I'll go away and put the op what I think is the, the needed energy availability. It might be that they need to recover from being amenorrheic for, for six months. And that, in that regard, we're trying to get to those higher thresholds. And maybe it's someone looking to reduce body fat. And then we want to do that safely. And I'll still use energy availability to ensure there's enough baseline energy, but we're just kind of minimizing that. So that's, but I don't get anyone counting calories. That's that's the key. But I'm using kind of structure to go, okay, this is the reason why I'm trying to get you to eat this much. And then there'll be a real visual plan around that's breakfast, lunch, dinners, snacks. So it's a really easy way to put the pieces together. But yeah. the framework is around <clears throat> different days of training and, and getting the energy right. But then getting the, the distribution of the energy right is the key. Yeah, I love it. I'm I'm the same and I, I don't get people to count calories. I actually did a whole podcast episode around why I don't think it's very useful for triathletes to count calories for yep. so many reasons, yep. some yep. of which we've touched on today. So it's nice to see that the New Zealand sports dietitians are on the same page as the yeah. New Zealand. So it is something like I'll often present case studies and I'll, I'll get challenged on it. We've actually just about to publish research on 55 recovered REDS patients around their uh facilitators and barriers to uh, to increase energy availability and increasing energy intake and increasing meal frequency causes that was the, it causes anxiety yep but there was also a relationship with knowing what they needed to eat reduced that anxiety as well so often the thing i often hear from my patients is Everyone's told me I've had reds. They just told me I need to eat more, but I never know how much I need to eat. And that yeah. just stresses me out the whole time. So hard. So it's like, okay, here's a framework. And then I kind of present it as this is a blueprint for the next 12 weeks. And it's like, okay, then hopefully in that time, we'll have two repeated blood tests. And maybe we need a bit more energy. Maybe you don't need all this and you start going pretty good, but it creates that kind of structure and routine. And often... That's another thing they benefit from. What they've told us they benefit is having the structure. They like the they like the structure in place, and that's a big part of it with energy availability with um, around appetite. So we know appetite reduces. So sometimes the simple things where a lot of athletes can easily implement those in low energy availability, their their appetites dysregulated. So giving them some kind of what's it called structure. And actual amounts can be quite helpful. But again, the amounts is just food. It's just options. Mm. So they're eating food. They're not eating calories. But yeah, there's a rationale to why they're eating those kind of options. 
Yeah. Sometimes you just don't need to tell everyone all the detail that goes into a plant. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. So and I'll, I'll talk to them side. as well. Yep. So every patient that I feel like if there's a young patient with their parents, I'll say like, if I'm talking about calories, does that cause any stress? And they're just like, nah, like one thing I've learned from clinical psychologists is they're like, they'll know it anyway. So mm. you telling them is like, that's only in our more disordered, I guess, patients. And with our clinic, if there is, that's the specialist will do that review. And if there is a high level of disordered eating, then we'll use clinical eating disorder services for them to yep. start working on different ways of eating. Yeah. And a message to that type of person to eat more is not going to land well either. Like it's not useful. No. It's not helpful. <laughs> it's not going to no. actually change things. Yeah, and what we've found is we often see a lot of those patients as they come back from those services um, and they want to return to sport, but they've just they've got a real limited plan, I guess. So we're trying to give them more, a lot more variety and a lot more keeping the structure, but just opening them up to eating a whole range of different foods again. Mm, yeah, it does take a multidisciplinary approach. Like I'm working with triathletes. It is, you know, the sports physician and the psychologist and the sports dietitian and the coach and all the things to make sure that all bases are covered. It's not just one person trying to work yep. with an athlete. It needs to be that same message and everyone helping all the different components to help somebody get their body working properly again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's where I'm lucky with where I work because it's all sort of clinical based and private healthcare. It's a really, yeah, stimulating environment, but quite fortunate because everyone's on the same page and yeah that's why it's been so interesting coming from sport where you have certain situations where you've got a great environment and then you have another environment which is just you know this is going on but it's really hard for you to get that athlete to buy into it because you just don't have the consistency in the voices or mm. um, coming from the right voice and that's what I'm lucky with because I if there's been the diagnosis, there's been a whole process before they see me and they're like, right, tell me what to eat. I'm, I've kind of got over that phase now. Yeah, that's good. So, so that's good. So that, yeah, so that the, the, the way I work is, is in a different setting, I guess. I try to emphasize that to people. I'm kind of working in the recovery space rather than just, but I'll see a range of athletes, but that's kind of my sort of focus a lot of the time. Yeah. But we've talked about some of those things to identify it, which I think is really good. Can yep. you touch on for me the continuum of low energy availability or REDS, like and the different kind of levels that we have? Because it, it is important to understand that you're not in low energy availability or you're not. It is a continuum. Yes. And we have some yep. good information yep. around that. If you can dive yep. into that a little bit for us, Dan. Yeah. So I guess the, the key thing now is um, probably the biggest term, I think, is the best term, is a problematic low energy availability. So I think that's something we should all be have a good understanding of is that different times in the day or waking up in the morning, you're in low energy availability. You haven't eaten all night. That's inadvertent. It's not going to really make any difference. But it's the exposure to the low energy availability in individual, at an individual level. So you might have someone else that's exposed to the same low energy availability, but their system doesn't seem to be as impacted. So mm -hmm. that's also hard for patients to understand. And be, that's because there's a genetic element, but there's also the psychological stress or the situations someone's in. And that's also then having effects to cortisol levels, which is further suppressing estrogen. So to go back to your questions, the different thresholds really come from the work of Anne Locks, who used those numbers to start to quantify, if I feed someone this and I do this really well-controlled study, what starts to happen? And so it's just like a dose response, I guess, of energy availability. And what they found was once probably they go below that 30, that reproductive system starts to unravel within about 24 to 48 hours. So 30 kilo, kilo gives, 30 kilo gives, gives, Yeah, yep. per kg of fat-free mass, which... Yeah, which is your muscles probably, and your bones. Yeah, let's say um, for just a real crude example, you've got someone that's uh, 60 kilograms, and they go for a 40 minute run, there maybe they expend like 400 calories in that run. And so if they're eating, let's say 2,500 calories, they've got about 2,000 calories left to their system. Depending on the size of their body mass, that's probably gonna be pretty close to 45, okay? 
if they go into low energy availability, if they're eating sort of 1600 calories a day, that might mean they've got about 1100 calories left over. So you can kind of think about as how much left over to the system. Mm. And in those really well controlled lab studies, they found within about 48 hours, if they can get that threshold really accurate, that uh, reproductive system, all like insulin, um, estrogen, within 24 hours starts to reduce. So yeah. there's real clear signs that it's impacting. Where the challenge has been is they've re replicated these studies in real world situations where they've done food diaries and and they don't see the thresholds as clearly. And that's probably just because there's a bit of error. Yeah. But even in those studies, I think it was there's a 50% chance of quite significant menstrual disturbance at below 30. The other interesting part is it's kind of body system dependent as well. And that's where the bone and the analoxes work. The bone actually started to down regulate as soon as you went below 45, which is quite interesting for adolescent athletes. So I think adolescents, especially if there is a there's an injury to the bone or you at that age you're just trying to build tissue and you don't want to compromise really anything. So that's another reason why, you know, low energy availability in adolescence is really can be quite problematic. So that's how it works. And but again, it's at an individual level. It's there's no sort of black and white here. And there's going to be error if you analyze that. So that's what you're looking at from a health perspective is like not diagnosing it, but are you healthy? Are you getting through training? Are you regular cycle then, then you know your your energy availability is adequate mm. and with our elite athletes we can start looking a lot closer with different monitoring tools around the length of the cycle how they respond to training but from a general population we're just looking at uh, are you healthy are you having a regular cycle are you getting through your training those are the kind of things we're going to look at mm. yeah i think that's really good to highlight but i guess as well like coming back to the um problematic lea we know there are nutrition interventions such as, you know, carbohydrate restriction for certain trainings. And it doesn't mean just because you do that once a week or, you know, that you're going to start getting an LEA. It's like, but it's probably you need to have an understanding that the more you start doing these things, you need you need to keep, you need to, you need to monitor it. And that's mm -hmm. where the elite environments with Olympic have the, or they should have these monitoring systems in place. But the challenge is when you go and do that without that physiology support, without the medical support, things can uh, start to slip. And a lot of those studies like Louise's and John Hawley's work, they're actually isoenergetic. So they've still got the same energy. They're just changing the carbohydrate and the fat. Yep. But when you someone goes away and does that, they often just take a whole lot of energy out of their diet. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. They don't just start massively increasing their fat intake overnight normally. <laughs> No. Yeah, it's important to highlight that it is a short-term shift too, like a day or two or three is enough to drop your cycle out for that month. So it's something you have to be on top of relatively yeah. quickly and, you know, prolonged low energy availability is not what we're aiming for, but short-term, you know, maybe a little bit of advantage as long as it's well supported with nutrition. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's what um your guys work in AIS. I think there's a really nice information that just came out recently around body composition and when you should look to do interventions around how much support you have, the age of the athlete. I think that's a really nice way to put it, where if you are in these really well-supported environments, you can do it in a safe way. Mm. But when you don't have those resources, that's when things go. And there's toxic cultures. That's just a recipe for the yeah. energy availability start getting compromised yeah. pretty quickly. Don't get me started. Don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, I've never worked in triathlon, but yeah, we see, we see a lot of triathletes. So. Yeah. I'm really passionate about just getting them to feel training and understanding the periodization yep. of that, which nobody knows how to do unless they've had some support, but they all want to lean up every single yeah. one of them. Yeah. Like one in a hundred doesn't. And, yep. you know, so they're constantly trying to cut back calories, trying to scale back to drop some body fat for an event, but then putting themselves into low energy availability and basically trying to push shit uphill because they've affected all of their body systems yep. to the point where it's just not working. So, yeah, I see that really commonly, which is why I built the Triathlon Nutrition Academy to teach triathletes how to actually eat to support their training so that this doesn't happen because it's very, yeah. very common. And I guess for you guys is what we see because a lot of the referrals I'll see come initially through the stress fracture injury. 
Yeah. And just how catastrophic that is once you've had one, the risk of another one, and it's just like. Do you know the percentage? I was trying to think of find that the other day. There's a percentage of like once you've had one, your incidence yeah. of having a second is I think super it's, high. Yeah. Don't quote me, but I think it's as high as thirty to fifty percent of the the re risk. Yeah. I get a lot of that would become come from just the behaviour, I guess, as well. Like we know that. If it's caused by low energy availability, it's not like they're just going to snap out of that typically. Yeah. So it's yeah, it's devastating. We, we I work with quite a few athletes that progress to um, the college system in the US, and then we'll have occasional and then like reviews, and you'll see the the medical kind of follow ups, and you'll you know you'll see the stress fracture occur again, and yeah, yeah, just yeah, it's disappointing because then you're not then you're not training and then you're not racing. So let's not get to that point, people. Let's catch yeah, it before yeah. that point. Oh Yeah, and we have these conversations regularly because I, I think for most, probably like triathlon would be in that category as well, like strength, strength, power, like power to weight ratio. It's, it's often the lowest hanging fruit is like let's reduce body composition. Yeah. But I think the thing is if you take that low hanging fruit, there's a 50% chance that you could bring the whole tree down and then you once you start getting into – that real problematic LEA, it can be a 12-month process to to get them back and get the body comp right as well. That can be two years. Yeah. So we've seen that in patients that so just the lot you're just really risking things if if you're not doing it with good support and yeah, like I'm, good monitoring and that's the hard part for the those not in those like systems. I love that analogy, like bring the whole tree down. I think that's a good one. I'm gonna use that. Yeah, I've just been thinking about that because <laughs> these conversations all the time because it's what most people go for they're like oh we'll get you leaner we'll get you faster it's like yep but there's been a three-year history of stress fractures and LEA so I think everyone comes to the table different in that situation and you need to have the the medical history and the context to yep I agree I agree so many gold nuggets there (laughs) so somebody like I don't want people to be thinking that they're in low energy availability but some things to think about like what's um just general advice for somebody to make sure that they, you know, aren't heading along that continuum. And if they think that they are, what are the best places to get some support? Yeah. So I guess what we've talked about the risk factors and what to look out for, it sort of goes back to what you were saying. I think the key thing is the more that we've looked at case study after case study and put presentations together, if athletes are actually getting really close to those recommendations from the IOC, the, a lot of the work that's done around carbohydrate availability, protein, when those are met, they're in a really good state of energy availability. Yeah. So it's having that awareness. And I think the best place to often start where we've found, and the same with other um, bits of research, is that pre, during, and post. If you start working on those and you start training more, you naturally start to get better. Um, yep. And then a, a lot of this can come down to the gut and being able to tolerate more. But I think you need to have the awareness of those quality sessions of you know when the intensity is getting higher that we need that carbohydrate and we need to think about recovery but then we need to also think about it's not just you know 150 calorie protein shake with water it's like okay you'll be on the bike for four hours how are we going to start to get that energy back in the system when you're training again in 24 hours so those are the kind of things i think you need to consider and like if you are an athlete just knowing that you should be periodizing energy across different days you know and that could be framed around your your exercise but also just having that awareness that if you're in the same thing every day but you've got huge train demands one day to the next you're going to be up and down and not only your performance but long term your energy availability might start getting compromised couldn't have said it better myself dane (laughs) so carbs are your friend my friend don't be afraid of carbohydrate yeah and i guess there's that um nice new uh blog that was written in bjsm a couple weeks ago which really sort of alluded to female efforts in particular around carbohydrate and there's potentially another mechanism at play around um, LEA and it's again there's just more stress hormone there's more cortisol so maybe a lot of that work we just haven't done in females around carbohydrate periodization and it's just something again to you know be aware of that it might not be as simple as what we see in men Mm. yeah we're getting there in that space aren't we slowly slowly It'll yep. be another five to 10 years, but we'll have all the magic answers soon. Yep. Well, thank you so much for diving into Reds with me, giving us a bit of an update on the, the new things that are changing and what somebody could actually do if they were 
worried about being in low energy availability. It's been awesome. I didn't want to do this episode myself, so I've brought in the big guns to <laughs> he's all across the research to give us the the lowdown. If people want to find you, Dane, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, probably I'll, I'll go to accessportsmedicine.co.nz. So we have, I try to put up some information there around, there's lots of information on the clinic. We can see people all around the world or the country and also try to keep active on LinkedIn, try to update a few things. I'm not too good on the other social media. I'm pieces. trying to get you on Insta. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I go on there, but I look at fishing tips rather than uh, nutrition. So. <laughs> It's a, it's a beast. You either have to like fully commit to it or don't because, yeah, it's huge. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, it is because I see so many challenges with patients that I see with social media. So it's a, it is a hard one. Yeah. We'll compliment. just get, we'll just have to get you back on the podcast to spread the message far and wide. Yeah, that might be this. Oh, I'll link those things in the show notes if somebody does want to look you up. Can't find you on Insta, but can find you on LinkedIn. Does anyone use LinkedIn? I don't know, probably not. But you go to our website. Um, yeah, we try to put out. We have a good database of patients and physios, so we're always trying to put out blogs and the latest information to keep people abreast of what's going on in this space. Okay, cool, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dane. Thanks for your time. Cool, thanks, Darren. And I'll talk to you soon. Cheers. Thanks for joining me for this episode of the Triathlon Nutrition Academy podcast. I would love to hear from you. If you have any questions or want to share with me what you've learnt, email me at podcast at dietitianapproved.com. You could also spread the word by leaving me a review and taking a screenshot of you listening to the show. Don't forget to tag me on social media at dietitian.approved so I can give you a shout out too. If you want to learn more about what we do, head to dietitianapproved.com. And if you want to learn more about the Triathlon Nutrition Academy program, head to dietitianapproved.com forward slash academy. Thanks for joining me and I look forward to helping you smash it in the fourth leg. Nutrition!